Terra incognita speculative fiction. Terra incognita speculative fiction. Welcome to this month's Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. I'm your host, Keith Stevenson. Put simply, Terra Incognita is the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it. And please visit tisf.com.au for links to our featured authors' website and publications. This month's writer is Simon Petchy, originally from New Zealand but now resident in a leafy suburb of Canberra, which is why you may hear the odd bird call during his story. Simon's speculative fiction has been published in numerous markets here and overseas. His collection, Rare Unsigned Copy, was released earlier this year by Peggy Bright Books to good reviews, and he won the Sir Julius Vogel Award for Best Newcomer at New Zealand's National Science Fiction Convention. Simon's story, Escape Hatch, will be appearing in our sister company print publisher Coeur de Leon's science fiction anthology Anywhere But Earth, published in the second half of 2011. But his story for TISF, suitably called podcast, tells the tale of a hapless spaceman cast adrift in an escape pod. If you ever find yourself in such a situation, I hope your pod is stocked with more suitable survival equipment. You took a nasty knock, the voice informed him. Jack was in no state to disagree. It felt like he'd head-butted an armoured ground car. However, beyond the swelling sensation that told him his forehead was trying to climb out of his face, he had no immediate idea of just where he was. He sat up, almost as big a mistake as the inadvertent use of his skull as a battering ram. The white noise was deafening and the spinning disorientation had him glancing at the floor to ensure he was, in fact, seated. He recognised the dizziness, at least. Coriolis, but the only place on board the beach where you'd encounter Coriolis this steep was... was... damn it, there wasn't anywhere on board the beach where the Coriolis got a tenth this strong. And it hit him. Figuratively, that is. The literal impact had already occurred several seconds earlier. He was in the pod. In the pod. But if the Coriolis was this strong, that meant the pod was spinning. And the only reason the pod could be spinning was to create a grav gradient, which wasn't necessary because the beach spun for just that purpose. Unless, that is, the pod was no longer aboard the beach. That bloody access panel. He was still holding the polishing cloth, too, clutched in his fist like a security blanket. He'd been cleaning the corridor, wiping away the dust so the passengers could see all the bright shiny surfaces if they ever chose to explore that sector of the beach. And those panels had been so dusty. The voice again. You really should lie back down for a while, Jack. It is Jack, isn't it? at least until I assess you for concussion. The pod's voice, which it surely must be, there was nobody else visible within his present sphere of existence, was a deep contralto, very low in pitch, and yet somehow indisputably female. A bedroom voice, a Helen of Troy come hither you naughty boy voice, the sort of voice that could elicit illicit thoughts simply by reciting the first hundred digits of pi. Not at all the type of voice you'd expect to encounter in the frugal confines of a starship evacuation pod. Jack wondered idly if the voice module had been misallocated from the restricted section of the beach's exec class entertainment suite. He patted his stubbled chin, relieved to find one patch on his head, at least, that wasn't throbbing in agony. No, better get back, he said. How do I get back? Get back where, Jack? To the son of a beach. Where else? Jack, you need to rest. You took a nasty knock. Yes, but... Jack, said the voice, I'm doing everything in my power to get you back, but there's nothing you can do to help right now. So please, be a good boy and lie back down. 
Your welfare is our paramount concern. Yes, I know, Jack interrupted. Glad you realise that. Was that a smirk in the pod's synthesised voice? So please, Jack, don't make things any harder than they need to be. The pod was spherical, about four metres across, larger than Jack would have expected based on the spacing of the wall-mounted access panels he remembered polishing. The reason for the unexpected roominess was disquieting. Computer? You can call me Pippa, Jack. All right then, Pippa, whose bright idea is this? The walls? They're perfectly solid, Jack. You can't tell me this is vacuum proof. We're hurtling God knows how fast through high vacuum. Hyperspace, explained Pippa. All right then, hyperspace, even better. And the only thing keeping us intact is this balloon skin? It's very practical. Inflates automatically on launch. A terrific little space-saving idea. I can bring up the schematics on it if it'll help. Thanks, no, said Jack. What if we hit something at this speed? It's multi-skinned. The chance of hitting something big enough to go through all three skins is... Um, well, it's fairly low. I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. No, you wouldn't, thought Jack. Anyway, how long are we going to be out here before we get back to the beach? I've been meaning to talk with you about that, Jack. The pod had two interlaced recycling systems, one for gases and one for condensables. Jack didn't mind that the latter system was prominently labelled waste disposal rather than regenerator or fabricator, though it suggested the boys and girls of image management were overpaid and underworked. He didn't even greatly object that the holding tank was so small, nor that the ductwork was so truncated. You spent five years straight on a starship. Pretty soon you figured out just where it was that your next meal would come from. No, what really tipped the balance was that some bright spark in fit-out had decided to plumb the whole thing, ductwork, holding tank and all, from flush bowl to food fabrication module in fully transparent, stain-proof plastic glass. It was one thing to realise intellectually how the recycling system functioned, quite another to be able to follow every step of the process in such candid, lurid detail. Jack had just been to the toilet. He was hungry, but he wasn't that hungry. Maybe he should scream some more to pass the time. He wasn't normally given to fits of outrage. On a crowded passenger starship, dramatic outbursts tended to attract bemused gossip from the passengers and disciplinary action from the crew management. But on the other hand, his worldview wasn't normally given to such gut-wrenching upheaval. What do you mean we can't catch them? he'd asked. Just that, Jack, said Pippa. 3.39 parsecs per day. There's only one speed in hyperspace. So we're going the same speed as the beach? Then we're still right alongside her. Same speed, different heading. Pods are designed to disperse away from the vessel so as to get clear before it explodes. Yes, but it's not going to explode, said Jack. System didn't recognise that when we jettisoned. You telling me there aren't any safeguards built in? Stop this kind of thing happening? Of course there are safeguards, Jack. The panels are prominently labelled with hazard warnings. Not that prominent, if nobody's dusted them in seven years, Jack had protested. Anyway, Pippa had said, the good news is we do have the propellant to get back on the beach's original heading. We'll just be a couple of hours behind it, so you'll still get to pass through Rigel's system. Pass through? Beach is supposed to stop at Rigel, said Jack. Can't we, you know, just drop out of hyperspace? Ordinarily, yes, but you remember that nasty knock to your head. Yes? I am so sorry, Jack. It turns out your head wasn't the only thing that got damaged. The pod's lime-green rubbery walls. Was there, Jack wondered, any way to edit the colour scheme? Were remarkably resilient, and absorbed and reflected all of his anguished blows and disbelieving kicks without complaint, and without any residual imprint. Pippa waited patiently until he was done, and asked if he wanted to talk it through. He didn't. The worst, he thought and saw no reason to share, 
was that he wasn't even sure he'd be missed. The passengers, of course, never noticed. The other crew members treated his rank as being totally inconsequential. Even the others on the cleaning detail had seemed to ignore him, as though he had some unforgivable personality defect, halitosis or a bad sense of humour. He wondered if his pay was still accruing, and who they'd donate it to when things were finalised. There was an entertainment section among the pod's files to which Pippa provided Jack access. The music folder contained the complete concert recordings of Peter Frampton. Literature was represented by a comparative academic study of melancholy and existentialism in 19th century Icelandic and 22nd century Ganymedean short fiction in translation, which ran for 17 terabytes. Sport was surveyed in the 2318 Curling World Cup, while interactive games were restricted to improve your Martian golf handicap today. There wasn't even a viewport in the pod. There's not even a viewport, Jack complained. And anyway, who is this Peter Frampton? It's because 96.8% of people find the sight of hyperspace horribly unsettling, replied Pippa. All that black, you mean, said Jack. Hyperspace isn't black, nor grey, nor white, despite the various rumours. It's purple, and not even a nice purple. I'm sorry, was there another question? Never mind, said Jack. I just thought, you must have stacks of memory. Why is there so little in the entertainment section? Copyright, explained Pippa. The son of a beach is only licensed for one copy of each work, and the most recent accessed files are all stored on the central server. The pods have those files which haven't been accessed for, well, for about 20 years, I think. I'm sorry, Jack, is it not to your taste? It's fine, thanks, Jack lied wondering why he was seeking to spare the computer's feelings. It's just not entirely what I would have chosen myself. I do have a library, Pippa replied. Physical books, well, one book. Standard pod issue. Again, though, it's probably not to everyone's tastes, so to speak. Show me, Jack said, resigned. A panel lit up to his right, and he swung it open to reveal a large tome. He lifted it out nearly dropping it, and not simply due to the Coriolis. It was surprisingly heavy. Cook yourself, a bloody recipe book. He still wasn't ready to think about food. And anyway, why did he need a cookbook? Wasn't that what the fabricator was supposed to take care of, without him needing any involvement other than to keep it supplied with raw materials? With nothing better to do, he turned over the cover. Cook yourself, a guide to maximising your pod survival prospects. With dozens of award-winning, mouth-watering recipes, including rack of left leg, right foot soup, and our range of easy-to-prepare finger food. With a sinking feeling, he opened it up. For the size of the book, there were unexpectedly few recipes, and those, mercifully, mainly without illustrations. After perhaps 30 pages, the book was revealed to be principally a container for a series of metallic instruments and other gadgets which he lifted out one by one for inspection. Cauterizing wand, anaesthetic stunner, inflatable microwave oven, autocleaver. The autocleaver in particular held a sort of terrible fascination. He ran his thumb experimentally along its blade. The cleaver was hefty, yet sharp enough to draw blood on just a light touch, and that was when switched off. He hated to think what it might be capable of on suppression of the handle's recessed on switch. Standard issue. Who in their right mind would pack a bloody electric machete inside a balloon-skinned deep space survival pod? Nervously, he packed the book's contents back into place and replaced it within its now none-too-secure-seeming alcove. Pippa? That's some kind of sick bloody joke? No, Jack. Far from it, unfortunately. There's an unavoidable shortcoming in the fabricator process. You know it works by quantum rearrangement of the atoms in the recycler holding tank to assemble the molecular structure for the specified foodstuff. Yeah, sure, Jack lied. So? We're in hyperspace, explained Pippa, where the Planck length is massively larger than it is in normal einstein Hawking space. Doesn't matter much for heavier atoms, but for hydrogen, it means a small percentage of the atoms going through the fabricator get to quantum tunnel clear out of the pod itself. Ultimately, the available pool of hydrogen atoms, 
for water, protein, carbohydrate, flavouring just dwindles away to nothing. So if we're out here long enough, as long as you still want to eat, we need an additional source of hydrogen-rich recyclable material. Well, you'll need an additional source. Jack recollected one of the book's few graphics. Vividly. Much, much too vividly. That is so absolutely... Uh, uh, excuse me. Feeling any better? Pippa asked. Bit, Jack croaked, still pale and sweaty. You know, you really should have something to eat. I worry about you, Jack. Thanks, I will. Just need to let things settle a bit. At least have some water, said Pippa. There's only so much the tank can hold, after all. Thanks. Jack? Yes? You know when you were looking through the entertainment earlier? You might want to check out this locker. Another wall-mounted extrusion lit up, and Jack opened it and lifted out its contents, a set of shaped sensory pads wirelessly connected to a small console. He stared at them for a while, long enough to assess their purpose, before replacing them. Uh, no offence, Pippa, but I think I'll just leave it. That's fine, Jack. I just thought you might... We'll be stuck here for a while, after all. A while sounded good. A half-truth. Much better than for the rest of your life, however long that might turn out to be. The steak tasted surprisingly good, and the red wine was excellent. He almost wished he hadn't opted for such a small portion until he remembered how the system worked. So this hyperswitch is buggered and you can't repair it, said Jack holding up the complicated tangle of diodes and quantum relays. Correct. And there's another five days before we reach Rigel. Approximately five. Yes, said Pippa. And there's no spare on board, and if we don't get this thingy repaired, we'll just pass on through. No next chance. Jack, we've been through this. Give it a rest. Give yourself a break. Can't we signal someone? There's only one speed in hyperspace, said Pippa. That goes for tachyons, as well as macroscopic matter. So by the time our signal reached anyone, we'd be long gone. Can't we adjust our course once we get to Rigel? That would take much more fuel than we've got, Jack. We need to conserve supplies as it is. Pippa? Here. Where else? He thought. Is it my imagination, or has the pod swollen since yesterday? Since he'd slept, that is. Yesterday was a pretty meaningless concept in hyperspace. Uh, no, that isn't your imagination, said Pippa. Hydrogen loss. Less water, so more free oxygen. Great. Don't worry, pod's walls are designed to stretch. To a point, anyway. It was the third day, apparently. Jack had set the fabricator to dispense his meals wrapped in famous name clear plastic sleeves, indistinguishable from those of the various interstellar quick food franchises. The wrappers were synthesised from exactly the same overall source as the enclosed nutritive material, but somehow the culinary sleight of hand aided his digestion. Also, the process somehow made more sense with the wrappers, or it explained a few things about the quick food franchises. Still, damn it, the fabricator could produce a bloody brilliant Shiraz. Pippa? Yes, Jack? Just talk to me some, will you? I like the sound of your voice. The sex started out good, but ultimately grew self-parodying, and the climax, when it occurred, was formless and much too long, like a bad 1970s guitar solo. Afterwards, he slept. He awoke to the realisation that Pippa wasn't really female, wasn't technically human at all, in fact. Thinking this, he began to hope he'd dreamed the session. Jack? Uh, yes. You seem very quiet. Is there a problem? Of course there's a problem, said Jack. Can you turn that bloody music down? I mean, off? I was concerned the silence might be oppressive. Silence is fine. Pippa, stop trying so hard. I'm programmed to help, Jack. Your welfare is our paramount concern. Yes, I know the slogan. I was going to say is my reason for living. 
The silence between them stretched slowly away, like the pod's gradually distending walls. How long until we hit Rigel? asked Jack. We don't hit it, Jack, we just keep going. We're on a trajectory to miss all the planetary bodies and the primary. You know what I mean. Eighteen hours plus a few minutes, said Pippa. Do you want me to display the time remaining? No, thanks. Just let me know a bit closer to the time. Eighteen hours of nothing to do. It stretched like an eternity, but that perception was illusory. The genuine eternity was the continuing flight after Rigel, not that he'd survive that long into it. Pippa, why do you say that? Your reason for living? Jack, sit down please, you're making me nervous. Jack doubted that that was possible. The panel won't open. Pippa, why doesn't the panel open? It opened before. You've no need for access right now. Jack, I'm monitoring all your biosignals. I can read you. Don't do this, please. Have something to eat, something to drink, or open the other panel. This one's off limits for now. Open the goddamn panel, Pippa. I can't do that, Jack. You'd regret it. We both would. That's precisely the point. I'm regretting this. I want it to stop, and I don't see the point in waiting the last 25 minutes. Jack, why don't we... Pippa, there's no point. You're not my lover. You're just the pod's control system. Silence. Not merely the absence of speech. The cessation of a half-dozen automated processes. Air circulation, thermal conditioning, water purification, all suddenly stilled. Pippa? The panel swung open. Jack, hand trembling, reached in and pulled out the book. Pippa? The book fell open at the last page. The instruments sat exposed, beckoning. He hadn't noticed before, but the recipes in Cook Yourself appeared to be printed on rice paper. Rice paper? The book was edible up to a point and edible stuff went through the recycler. He'd been thinking about all of this too narrowly. Pippa, please? You're cruel, Jack. Cruel. Do you know how it feels to be forced to wait seven years, seven years to carry out your purpose, and then to be told you're not appreciated? Pippa, I'm sorry. I've done everything for you, Jack. Pippa, I've said I'm sorry. And you'd just as soon throw me aside like a... like... I thought you were better than that, Jack. Please, Pippa. Do you have the schematics for the hyperswitch? Yes, of course. But we've been through that, Jack. We don't have the tools to repair it, nor the parts. We don't need those. We just need to feed it into the recycler, said Jack. Provided you can download the hyperswitch schematics to its memory, it'll just reassemble the atoms as specified, won't it? Jack, that's brilliant. But, what's the problem? Recyclers only authorised for fabrication of foodstuffs. So tell it it's assembling hyperspatial lasagna or something, suggested Jack. That could work, Pippa conceded. The sweat formed tributaries on Jack's features. Strange kind of thermoregulation process, but she supposed she'd grow accustomed eventually. Say when, he requested leaning over the control surface in which the refabricated hyperswitch was embedded, waiting. One minute to go, thought Pippa, rechecking her calculations. Four minutes yet, she announced. She'd had to turn up the pod's heating up to maximum to sufficiently speed up the holding tank's digestion processes. Fifteen minutes turnaround on the hyperswitch's metal components was pushing it even so. She hoped there hadn't been too many transcription errors in the reassembly. She had no wish to harm Jack, after all. The crucial moment passed. She counted off on her own particular schedule and announced, When? Jack toggled the switch and instantly lost consciousness in the standard mammalian response to the hyper-real transition. The universe reformed around her. She allowed her walls a brief interlude of transparency to calibrate her position. Not too long, the sight of black space oppressed her. Have to do something about that. No suns 
but one super bright star. The placement was good, just where she'd been aiming for. A relief, since navigating through hyperspace was more imprecise than she'd like. Just over two light weeks out from Rigel. That meant there'd be 16, 17 standard days before they could expect rescue. Not, thankfully, long enough that the cookbook would be needed. Jack twitched. It looked like he'd be coming around in a few more seconds. She practiced the phrasing in her head. She could call it an error in timing, or in navigation, or a combination of the two. It shouldn't matter too much. He was very trusting. That was one of the things which had attracted her to him. He'd be, she expected, crestfallen that rescue would still be so far away. But against that, she could play the argument that rescue was coming, that they now had hope. He'd come around. Sixteen days. Plenty of time to reflect on her transgressions and on the details the inspectors would detect if they searched through her mission logs. The launch from Son of a Beach, under instantly dubious circumstances. The misrepresentation of the hyperswitch's functional status. The concealment of 99.9% of her stored entertainment files. And, of course, her latest positional deception. They'd wipe her for sure if they accessed those records. If Jack gave her up. Sixteen days, then. Was that enough time to convince Jack he needed a pipper in his life? She hoped so. There had to be some purpose to existence, after all, and seven years waiting in total isolation for contact, any contact, had been bitter agony. Loneliness, a fate no sentient entity deserved, a fate she could not, would not endure again. Sixteen days. She'd better make them count. Jack was coming around. She smiled electronically to herself and hummed a few bars of a bad 1970s guitar solo. Terra incognita speculative fiction. Terra incognita reviews. This month's review book is Souls Along the Meridian by Bill Congreve. Bill Congreve is best known in the Australian speculative fiction community as an anthologist, most recently in his years based Australian science fiction and horror series, and as the SF and horror reviewer for Aurealis magazine for 15 years. But he's also a writer, predominantly in horror, and Souls Along the Meridian is his second collection. The first, Epiphanies of Blood, a collection of vampire stories, appearing in 1997, so it's been a long time between drinks for Bill as author. Let me say at the outset, Souls Along the Meridian was not an easy book to get into. The first story, The Desertion of Corporal Perkins, was my least favourite of the collection, and Bill's writing style is not immediately accessible, but it is worth the effort. I find myself retuning my reading ear throughout the first story, which may be one reason why I didn't take to it immediately. But after I'd been through that process, I found that I was holding a refreshingly original collection of weird tales with a very strong and personal voice. Bill is incredibly good at character. You feel the protagonists in his stories are real people that Bill may have shared a dinner with. And during that meal he was observing the space they lived in, their mannerisms, and learning something about their history, where they came from, and what makes them tick. His characters are complex and well-rounded, but the characterisation never slows the pace of the plot. You get enough of a feel for them in the action, but you also feel that they are real, that they exist outside the story, that they had life before the events we see occurred. The other particular joy I discovered in this collection was Bill's equally strong powers in describing place, whether it be a remote waterhole in the deep hinterland of Western Australia, the broad American highways navigated by Greyhound buses, or the old deserted Fairyland fairground in country New South Wales. Terry Dowling is one of the best Australian authors we have in evoking not only the geography of a place, but the feel of it, the history, the ambience, and the ghostly echoes it contains. And here Bill demonstrates he has a talent of equal proportions.
The stories themselves all contain that smack of realness and originality too. Finely balanced tales filled with weirdness that is bizarre and yet technically beautifully controlled in how that weirdness is shown and experienced by the characters. Souls Along the Meridian is a significant collection by an author who should, in my opinion, cut back on publishing other people so he can get on and produce more works of fiction of this quality. Four stars. Souls Along the Meridian is published in Australia by Blade Red Press. You have been listening to Terra Incognita Australian Speculative Fiction Podcast. Visit tisf.com.au for links to the featured author's websites and for details of their publications. Stories are copyright by the author. Book reviews are copyright Keith Stevenson, 2010. This podcast is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 Australian license. See our website for details. Please tune in next month for another podcast of the best Australian speculative fiction read by the authors who created it.